politicians are afraid to be the ones to put out there anything that will lead to the dislocation of any particular group. But the bold reality is that if we don't adjust and restructure, we are all going to go down the slippery slopes. I don't know when, but I know for sure we will go. And I believe, sir, that the Prime Minister has a unique opportunity. One cast on his shoulders by history, but one from which I believe that he should have the courage to confront fully. It is not a case of anybody expecting that there's a monopoly of information on any one side or in any one group. But what is the reality of our existence in Barbados? It is cumulative. It is cumulative even from pre-independence. And as a student of history, he would appreciate this. We have continued to believe, for example, that our pension system can be one that is fully funded by a government. But our pensions are responsible for over $200 million a year. We have continued to believe that we can provide every form of entitlement without necessarily having the capacity to earn for it. And when you have a national consultation, then no single entity can be blamed for putting on the table those matters which must now be the subject of discussion. I think it is fair to say that given our cultural and historical background, that both sides agree that the one thing Barbados must always have, like access to land, is access to education because it is the platform for empowerment of our people. Those who have made it and their children may have a comfortable upbringing, but they have no real wealth. And therefore, their only ability to remain above the water is for their children to have access to that education. Because we live in a society that is largely driven by credit. Then there are those who have not made it ever, but who very often are the victims of social and economic circumstances, combining particularly social circumstances that government, the government is not necessarily best structured to deal with. Physical abuse, mental abuse, addiction, etc. Because our social services are still designed to deliver a particular service rather than to move a person from a point of dependency to a point of independence and then to a point of giving back. These are structural issues. Our healthcare expenditure in healthcare has almost doubled just in the last, in just over the last decade. But yet there is no serious discussion on the financing of health care. Yet every other country in the world is confronted with a dedicated framework for financing health care, largely because people have access to information through the internet now and other forms, books, people traveling, and therefore the expectations as to what can be delivered when they are sick are far greater than 20 years ago when people were prepared sometimes to accept the will of the doctor or the nurse or the hospital or whatever. People are not prepared to do that today. And the bold reality is, sir, that we keep adding and adding and adding without rationalizing. The role of the private sector. The private sector in Barbados has to step up to the plate with a far greater level of aggression Equally, the government must ensure that its access, people's access to government-related services, be it the private sector or be it the individual, is more seamless and quicker than has existed. These are not easy to achieve, and they're not going to be achieved in the lifetime of any one government. But if we don't start now, and if we don't determine that the next decade is to reposition this country, then we will, like China and India, who dominated the global economy in the 17th and 18th century, only to go into abject decline as US, the United States, and Europe rose from the mid-19th century to the end of the 20th, we will recognize that we too can go that route. And simply being the number one developing country in the world, 
according to the UN Human Development Index in the 90s and the early 2000s means nothing. Just as Jamaica learned that being the number one developing country in 1970 meant nothing. But look at the other issues that we have to contend with. Why do we believe that it is such a bad thing for the workers of this country to own enterprises that have hitherto been owned by the government, but that provide a long-term public service in very often monopolistic conditions? The airport, the seaport, the last member who spoke, spoke about the transport board. Look at the facts. Last year, we came for $59 million for the transport board cumulatively in what we originally voted as supplementaries, and that does not include the subsidy from welfare, which is about another $14 million, and the subsidy from education, which is another $6 million. Can we afford to be spending $50 to $70 million on a transport board every year when the basic services like the police like the nurses, like the teachers, are likely to be undermined because we can't give them what they really need. Now, if everybody is frightened to say, I propose this and I propose that, then, sir, I don't have a difficulty with putting things on the table because the future will, as I said, the future will take care of the future. But there must be a discussion point. And it is not fair to the ordinary citizen out there who looks to us as the mechanic or the doctor or the lawyer who looks to us as the professional who must know how to get us out of these difficult circumstances. Constituent once told me, say, Mistress, I don't have to follow all of that because that's when we put you all there. That's for you all to do. And we have a duty, sir. And I said, I believe that the Prime Minister has the moral fortitude and the courage to start the process. He may not be there at the end. Probably won't. Because you're talking about a 10-year transformation. The Chinese don't think in terms of even decades. They think in terms of centuries. So do the Indians. But maybe that is the legacy of being a recent society. A society still trying to find its way. And when I look at these estimates, sir, there are some big ticket items that merit discussion. Some will give us medium term returns, some will give us early returns. Both sides have to be prepared as po politicians to put aside some of what I call the, the patronage aspects because we don't have the room for it now. Both sides, be it constituency councils, be it elements of urban, be it whatever, but what I will say is this, sir, that we and the public must know this, and I hope in his wrap-up the Minister of Finance will address it. He hinted at it yesterday in his first attempt, but I think he now has a duty to bring it together. He hinted about the challenges. That we have oil prices on an upward trend again. Food prices on an upward trend again. There is no doubt in my mind that the consequences, the immediate consequences of the very tragic and unfortunate tsunami in Japan and that part of the world will be increased insurance premiums in the short term, not to mention the other consequences that will be fueled from rapid capital works in the redevelopment of that country. And then we have the bogeyman, Pico. Ultimately, Clico will lead to about 200 million at least in additional debt to the Barbados government. And in the context, at least, and in the context of what we're doing, somebody may say, well, that's only 2 or 3% of GDP. But that takes away from the developmental activity that is merited and that is necessary to bring about transformation. Our tourism sector, sir, is a mature sector. And yes, the numbers this year are higher than the numbers last year, but the truth be told that they're still below the numbers in 2007, coming out of the United Kingdom, that is responsible for 40% of our market. Yes, in international business, we are facing difficult challenges from the established developed countries who will find every mechanism, or in the words of members in this house, recently who moved the goalposts on every occasion. 
But the truth is that our future development rests upon a recasting of the international business and financial services sector because it has no carrying capacity, Mr. Speaker, limits. Whereas tourism will. And while we have to restructure and renew our tourism product, even when we do that, there will be limits. Our manufacturing and our agriculture will be based on specialty areas in which we have a dominant advantage because we will never compete with Australia and Brazil in bulk sugar, but we can compete in specialty sugar, something called specialty Barbados sugar, because for four centuries the world has said it is among the best in the world. We can compete in Barbados rum. And instead of looking at a $70 million rum industry, we in this house should be planning out expenditure to support a $500 million rum industry in five years and a $1 billion rum industry in 10. The emerging economies of which the minister spoke yesterday that is driving global growth, they are no different from other human beings. Human beings have what I call a hierarchy of luxury tastes. They start with brandy and scotch and then they get tired of that and they come to rum. They have a hierarchy of travel tastes. They start with Europe, then they go to the pyramids and then they come to the Caribbean. And if you understand human behavior, then you understand how to position yourself. Is the power of government only to be able to tax and spend? Mm -hmm. No, it isn't. True. We legislate. Mm -hmm. We facilitate and coordinate. We regulate. We empower. And let's talk about it. What is the most important initiative that this government could put on the ground this year without casting an additional cent onto itself in debt? It is telecommunications reform. You have a generation of Barbadians, perhaps two, because you're really talking about people up to 40, who want strong, quick, fast access to broadband, but cheaper. Who are making businesses, there are at least five companies, sir, that I have come into contact with in the last three months, who are into digital marketing or digital delivery of products, etc. But they are the victims of a duopoly. Not that that is the intention of the Labour Party government, but that is the reality of what transpired. Digicel and cable and wireless almost live comfortably lording over the rest of the population. Instead, there has been no investment and no launch of 3G, of 4G, of WiMAX. And our citizens complain because when they go overseas, they have that ready access to broadband. We speak about free Wi-Fi access up to 256K in this country. Why? Because in the 1930s, people didn't know that in the Bayland, a Garfield Sobers would have emerged to become the best cricketer in the world. But he had opportunities. And in having opportunities, he was able to practice his craft and be noticed and to exploit it. If we give that free basic Wi-Fi access, it is the equivalent of free basic education because it opens up the horizons and it brings to the world, to our citizens, the opportunities of the world. What does it cost the government of Barbados? I don't remember, you have five more minutes. Thank you, sir. I didn't realize it was going so quickly. Regulatory reform, bringing the players together amending the legislation, and if necessary, this government in 2008 put on the table a cell phone tax. But a cell phone tax for the purpose of general revenue makes no sense. But if you tell every holder of a cell phone that in exchange for $2 a month, you could get free Wi-Fi wherever you are in Barbados, you can't even count the decimals that it will cost you per day to work out the third $2 divided by 30 days. All of a sudden, it becomes a reality. And I understand that the elements of the private sector now talking about it. But I'm saying to you, sir, in that context, what is it out of these estimates that this government, that this parliament wants to achieve with the Barbadian private sector, the Barbadian workers, and indeed, sir, the entire Barbadian society? What is our goal? Where are we carrying the country? 
Are we just in holding pattern for the sake of being in holding pattern? Because the difficult decisions are too difficult because the system of government that we have is too adversarial in nature to accommodate consensus decision making. We come out of these chambers and to a man and woman, we virtually agree on the manner forward. To a man and to a woman. But when we come in here, it is like the decades, the decades of Westminster adversarial tradition sap the energy from us. And all of a sudden we become the defenders of history rather than the promoters of a future. I say to you, Mr. Speaker, I too have to, after 20 years, ask myself many questions. And it has nothing to do with what happened last year. It has to do, in reality, with where we are. If there were the tensions I felt leading a political party in this country, there are the tensions I feel today. That we have to be able to step outside of the box and to recognize that we don't have the buffer to deliver as usual in the way that was done before by doing the same things that we have done all along. Sir, we have spoken in here, and I accept readily on this side too, that this debate is a sterile exercise because it becomes a glorified public meeting for five days. And the public of Barbados thinks that we're going mad. In Jamaica, ministers come into the well of the house with their public servants next to them, and they go through head by head. Members ask questions. We have a document in here under, under the Housing Neighborhood Program. There are not adequate details. Under um, other aspects in here, the explanatory note tells us for an asset under construction. What does an asset under construction mean? What kind of asset is it? Is it a chattel asset? Is it a wall? Is it is a building? What is it? But yet we have to vote on this because the exercise has become so still out that we have lost connection with the people whom we're trying to govern. And while we can entertain that and afford that when things are going well, sir, we cannot when we are on the margins of our existence as a people and a development model. So I say to you, sir, I pray, I pray that we will summon the courage to rise above. And even if it, it doesn't happen in one step, because that's a fairy tale. But I believe that the ability for us to fashion a new system of governance you have a former Prime Minister who has 20 years experience. You have a Prime Minister who is perhaps the most accomplished student of history. And I say that without any fear of contradiction, that we have had hold that post and who appreciates the dynamics of people and history and large events because in this we have to step back and see the large event of what is happening to us. And you have people on both sides now Members of the government who have been there sufficiently long to appreciate the true travails of representation and members of the opposition who are sufficiently recent in government to remember the true travails and the true complexities. And I say to you, sir, we stand at a unique opportunity in this country's history. Do not let us betray the legacy. And I say so, sir. Do not let us betray the legacy that has been given to us. Let us start now. It is going to take us about a year to get it right. But if we get it right and 90%, 80% of the population says, this is the road, then I'm sure even in the refashioned Barbados, we will improve our governance mechanisms so that this does not become an ad hominem personality cast a blame exercise that it has become not in its original format, but it has developed into over the years. I'm obliged to you, Mr. Speaker.